American Roots Music students. It's great to be back with you again today. We're going to talk about Chapter 5, and specifically Chapter 5 deals with Anglo-American uh, sacred music or religious music, uh, so to speak, what some would call gospel music, although you'll read in your textbook that uh, sometimes people use the, the term gospel song to refer to something that's much more specific than the broad body of American uh, religious music. So we begin our discussion today with the question, how did Anglo-American religious music get started here in our country in the New World? Psalmody. Psalmody. For the most part, um, psalmody was the rule of the day for the early settlers. The, the singing of the psalms as written in the Bible was pretty much the common practice for colonial churches for the first few decades. Essentially, this practice had uh, grown from the European traditions of chanting the psalms as written in the Bible. And of course, when we talk about singing the psalms, we have to recognize that, yes, we do have the words or a translation of the words that were written down uh, within the Bible. But um, we don't we don't have a complete picture as far as the melodies that were used. Why is that? Because um, the Bible did not include standard notation or any notation uh, for music. And of course, recording equipment did not exist at that time period. So, uh, you know, how did these songs sound? That's kind of conjecture. We, we do know the words. We don't know exactly what the melody was, which is a huge part of, of, of the song. But uh, nonetheless, um, it, it was common practice, and there are still congregations who do still sing the psalms. And again, we call this approach psalmody. In these days, it was such a common practice, and it was so popular, so important to many of the early colonialists, that um, the very, very first publication that was uh, released here in our country was actually known as the Bay Psalm Book. So it was such an important thing to many of the settlers that uh, they got right down to business in publishing uh, psalm books as well. Psalmody. Psalmody. For the most part, um, psalmody was the rule of the day for the early settlers. The, the singing of the psalms as written in the Bible was pretty much the common practice for colonial churches for the first few decades. Essentially, this practice had uh, grown from the European traditions of chanting the psalms as written in the Bible. And of course, when we talk about singing the psalms, we have to recognize that, yes, we do have the words or a translation of the words that were written down. Uh, within the Bible, but um, we don't we don't have a complete picture as far as the melodies that were used. Why is that? Because um, the Bible did not include standard notation or any notation uh, for music, and of course, recording equipment did not exist at that time period. So uh, you know, how did these songs sound? That's kind of conjecture. We we do know the words. We don't know exactly what the melody was, which is a huge part of, of, of the song. But uh, nonetheless, um, it, it was common practice, and there are still congregations who do still sing the psalms. And again, we call this approach psalmody. In these days, it was such a common practice, and it was so popular, so important to many of the early colonialists, that um, the very, very first publication that was uh, released here in our country was actually known as the Bay Psalm Book. So it was such an important thing to many of the settlers that uh, they got right down to business in publishing uh, psalm books as well. Shape note singing basically um, refers to the idea that you have certain shapes that symbolize certain scale tones. So if you've heard people sing the do, re, mi uh, thing, as some might call it, we're talking about a scale. Uh, a, a major scale is built up of seven notes. It's interesting to note that the first widely recognized form of white religious folk music to be found in our country um, was found in the shape note tune books, which were first published in the wake of the Second Great Awakening, which uh, began around the turn of the century, around the year 1800. The First Great Awakening had taken place 
uh, approximately seven years, or, or excuse me, 70 years prior to that. Uh, these were both uh, religious movements. Um, many would say that the Second Great Awakening had uh, really a great impact on the frontier, the Western frontier. One of the very most popular uh, sacred note, excuse me, uh, shape note singing uh, texts out there. One of the books that, that really taught people the tunes and the technique, um, and really probably the most popular uh, example, was called the Sacred Harp. So hence the term Sacred Harp Singing, which is interchangeable with shape note singing. How does this system work? I kind of demonstrated that a few moments ago, um, but again, the idea is essentially that we have certain shapes that designate certain scale tones. Camp meetings were another important phenomenon that uh, influenced religious life and religious uh, music in our country in the uh, 1800s specifically um, and beyond. During the first decade of the 19th century, a revival of interest in the hymns and the religion and the spiritual songs swept across our country. New methods of evangelism resulted from a shortage of, of ministers, trained ministers, and specifically there was a shortage, again, in the western states, in the new frontiers. Uh, maybe some of you have heard the term circuit riding preachers, circuit riders, uh, preachers who rode uh, through the country uh, spreading their message. Um, the lively and spirited camp meeting approach developed when it became clear that the Word of God could be spread more effectively when large numbers of people gathered together in worship. In other words, um, people could gather together um, to benefit from one sermon or, or a, you know, a minister could essentially preach to a large group of people that all came together to hear the message rather than the minister having to go to 10 people here and 10 people there. So it, would, it was a camp of people and they would sometimes stay for several days and uh, they would share their uh, enthusiasm and, and their message and um, they would also share their music and their ideas. Given the level of enthusiasm, it's easy to understand why this uh, phenomenon really became national in scope. It became a national phenomenon inasmuch by the 1850s, these camp meetings were so commonplace throughout the South and they were super uh, commonplace even uh, in in every region of our country, they were known through the mid, excuse me, the Midwest, and they were known in the in the Far East as well. So they were uh, truly a national phenomenon. Camp meetings uh, lasted um, sometimes for days, sometimes longer, and again, the movement was was very popular and very influential for for a substantial amount of time. The music of camp meeting spirituals. It's significant to note that because you had so many people coming together from so many different backgrounds, it was um, often hard to find a shared body of experience to, to build upon. These folks, uh, did not necessarily know the same hymn tunes, did not necessarily know the same songs. So um, one of the things that uh, the leaders found out uh, that they could do was to essentially write songs right on the spot, songs that, that, that the people there could have a hand in the creation of. So it was an exciting thing. It was, it was a way to help uh, everybody participate, but also um, it was something that, that you could basically do to to come up with, with material that everybody could relate to and everybody could learn right on the spot. So there was, as one can imagine, there was a simple formula that went into um, writing these, these uh, songs that uh, some call the camp meeting spirituals right on the spot. They had to be simple enough that people could pick up on them right away. These new compositions were often constructed from verses of already familiar tunes. In other words, they borrowed a line from this song and placed it over here by using a simple strophic form. If you're not familiar with the term strophic, when, when a song is strophic, it means that you have the same melody over and over again, but maybe you change the words. So the first verse mel melodically sounds just like the second verse, but the words are different. If you look in a standard hymnal, you'll see that all the time. Maybe a, a song has four verses, three verses, and sometimes they'll say, skip to the last stanza or whatever you're talking about. Um, the same melody, um, like... Uh, <laughs> or 
which is I'll fly away some glad morning when this life is uh, over. I'll, uh, well, that's the next line. But also sometimes uh, they'll sing uh, like a bird from prison, something. I can't remember the words. But the point being is that we're playing the same melody over and over um, as we change the words. Of course, the chorus is usually the same words, but verses are uh, interchangeable. These new compositions, again, were using strophic form, often borrowing phrases from other styles, or excuse me, from other songs, and they were a simple verse and chorus format, which is, is, a, is a style that we know very, very well, that permitted almost unlimited improvisation within a theme. And I hope you're uh, familiar enough now that you uh, with the term improvisation, I don't have to go over it, but I will, just to be sure. Improvisation is, again, the spontaneous, or usually spontaneous, but certainly the creation of music, the composition of music during a performance. Um, if I'm improvising with words, that means I change the words. If I'm imp improvising with the melody, it means I change the notes that I'm using. So if I were to improvise as I did for I'll Fly Away, um, it's pretty much the basic melody, but maybe I want to get a little uh, away from that. I want to kind of embellish that a little bit. Or maybe I want to go quite a ways from the melody. very far from the melody and a lot of people might listen to that and not really hear it as I'll fly away but um, some would so the idea of improvisation is again the creation of the music uh, during the performance mm -hmm. 